Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the GMAT Official Guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today we'll do some data sufficiency problems that you will find on page number. 207 but before we do the problems on page 207 there was one last problem on page 206 that uh, day before yesterday yesterday we did yesterday we did a multiple choice problem on day number seven today is our day number eight on day number six we did the data sufficiency problems on page number 206 and inadvertently I left out the very last problem which is number 282 on on page number 206 we'll do that one first after having watched the entire video if you find it helpful <coughs> and if you decide that you would like to work with me that you would like to hire my services you can reach me at kashwaniprep at icloud.com send me an email and we'll see what we can do let's look at the last problem on page number 206 which is a very straightforward very simple problem almost silly but we have to do it because it's there the question is what is 10% of y. Simple straightforward question. The first statement tells us that the 5% equals 5% equals 60. Well if 5% equals 60 then obviously 10% will equal 60 times 2. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we have just established that the first statement by itself is sufficient, we know the answer cannot be B, C or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at the second statement. Second statement tells us that y is 80% of 1500. y is 80% of 1500. If we know that y is 80% of 1500, obviously we can figure out the y. And once we figure out the y, we can figure out the 10%. The reason I did it out here is because it was too straightforward. But here, wasting time on the real exam to figure out exactly what it is, is not, it's not something uh, you should do. We don't care what y is. We simply have to understand that if we know y is 80%, we can figure out y. So once we know y, we can figure out the 10%, which means second statement by itself is also sufficient. The answer is D. The part that we're about to do is only for the learning purposes. It's not something that you will do in a real exam, just to get some practice. Let's do it now, shall we? So it says y is 80%, 80 of 1500. And what we want to find out is 10% of y. If you want to find out 10% of y, which is the same as saying one tenth of y. So let's take one tenth of y, shall we? If you divide this side by 10, that's one tenth of y, which is 10%. This is 10%. And since we divided this side by y, uh, 10, we either, have, we either have to divide this number by 10 or that number by 10. Let's divide this by 10. And now, now what we have here on this side, on the left hand side, what we have on the left hand side is 10%. Let's see what it works out to be, shall we? Very quickly. Divide top and bottom by 10. And essentially what we're looking for is 8% of 1500. What we're looking for here is 8% of 1500 and 8% of 1500, 1% 1 of 1500, 1% 1 of 1500 is 15, it's just 15 times 8, which is 120, which is exactly what we found there. If you ever do the work, if you ever do the work and you find it that you can get a conflicting answer, first statement tells you that y is 120, and second statement tells you that y is 150, then something has gone wrong. They should always agree if you end up doing the work, which you shouldn't. Now, if you don't like this method, we could have gone a little bit more traditional way, which is this way, okay? If you don't like this method, we can go this way. Y is 80%, 80% is the same as 8 over 10. Y is 80% of 1500. We could have gone that route. It's the same exact thing. Divide top and bottom by 10, 150 by 8, you will find. So what we find here is Y, which is going to be 1200. 150 times this is 1200, and therefore 10% 10 is 120. But all of that was unnecessary, you understand? So now we'll do the first problem on page 207. But all of that work we just did was unnecessary. I hope you understand that and you realize that and that you will not do that in the real exam, wasting your time unnecessarily. First problem on page 283 says that we have two classes. We have two classes, A and B. A and B. Make sure the book is always in front of you. Read the problem yourself because I 
paraphrase and I make a little bit changes in the wording of the problem but read the problem yourself and you will understand that what we are doing is the exact same thing. We are told that each person in A had seven points and each person in B we are told had five points. Now, in the actual problem it says assignments but I'm too lazy to write the word assignments so I just say points. The question simply is how many kids do we have? How many in A? How many students do we have in class A? Let's see what we are told. The first statement tells us that the total points in A and B equals 85. Simply knowing what the total points in A and B is does not help us at all in figuring out how many there are in A. It's not enough. I hope you are able to see that right away without doing any work because A and B, we have two unknown. We all, all we know is A plus B is 85. We cannot solve for two unknowns. We have to know A in order to figure out and we have to know how many people are in B. If we somehow can figure out how many people are in B, we know each of them got five points. We can multiply the number of people in B by five, figure out how many people got how many points was earned in class B, and we can subtract it from 85 and figure out how many points were earned by class A, divide that by seven and figure out the A, but we don't have that. Do you understand? So the first statement by itself, A, D, B, C, E. First statement by itself is not enough, which means the answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C, or E. Second statement tells us that there are 10 kids in B. 10 kids in B. Voila, there you go, you see? Again, second statement by itself. When you're looking at second statement, we cannot look at the first statement. But second statement by itself does not do any good. This information in first statement was useful, but was not enough, was not sufficient. Information in second statement is also useful, but it is not sufficient. The answer is not B. But if we put the two together, obviously we can figure out. Now we know there are 10 kids in B. Now we know there are 10 kids in B. That tells us that tells us that uh, they earn 50 points. They earn 50 points. But again, we shouldn't have to do this thing. I hope you realize that the answer here is C. Two, putting the two together is enough. I was about to do it, but you shouldn't have to. We have two, we have two statements, two, two equations. A plus B equals 85, and there are 10 people in B. We have two independent equations, and therefore we can solve for two unknowns. We shouldn't have to do this work. I'm just doing it purely for learning purposes. So, they are in 50 points. Since total points we were told in statement 1 was 85, that implies that, that implies that 35 points were earned in A. And since there are, since there are, since there are 5 in A, since each student got 7 points, there, that tells us, since each student got 7 points, that tells us there are 7 kids, 7 kids in A. Oh sorry, 5 kids in A. But all of that was unnecessary. The answer is C. It may seem it may seem trivial, it may seem insignificant to you why he's making so much fuss, it only took 10 seconds, but it always just takes 10 or 15 seconds in each problem and they add up very quickly. Don't do it. 284. In 284 we are what we are being asked is was was the February bill, was the February bill greater than January bill? First statement tells us, first statement tells us that the ratio, ratio of February to January is 26 to 25. Well, if the ratio of February bill to January bill was 26 to 25, then obviously we can clearly see that February bill was higher than January bill. For every $25 that you paid in January, you had to pay $26 in February. First statement by itself is quite sufficient. First statement by itself is quite sufficient. That tells us A, D, B, C, E. If that tells us that the answer cannot be B, C, or E, it would have to be either A or a D. Let's look at, let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that January bill plus the February bill equals 183 60. And simply knowing the sum of the two bills, simply knowing this, again we are not looking at first statement now, 
simply knowing that some of, some of the two bills cannot tell us which bill was higher. Second statement by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough. And therefore the answer is A. What they what they are hoping you what they are hoping that you would do is take this part here and take this part here and, and substitute 25 f equals 26 j put it in here so for f and g and and come to conclusion that we need both statement we do not need both statement first statement by itself is quite sufficient therefore the answer is a second statement by itself by itself is not sufficient therefore it it is not, answer is not d let's look at next one 285 285. Two eighty five tells us that we have a sequence S has one hundred and twenty tons. I'm going to erase this thing, it keeps coming in my way. Has one hundred and twenty terms. We have a sequence and we are told it has one hundred and twenty terms. The question simply is what is hundred and fifth term? First statement tells us that the first term is negative 8. Knowing what the first term is and knowing that there are 120 terms does not enable us to figure out what 105th term is going to be. Does it? Of course not. Answer cannot be. First statement by itself. First statement by itself is not enough. Since first statement by itself is not enough, answer cannot be A or D. It will have to be either B, C or B, C or, B, C or D, or B, C or E. Second statement tells us that each term, each term after the first one, each term after the first one is 10 more than the preceding term. There we go. If we know, again, second statement by itself, just knowing that the first term, uh, of each term after the first term is 10 more than the first, 10 more than the preceding term, does not enable us to figure out what 105th term is. B by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself is not enough. But if we put them together, of course we can figure it out. And this is a classic example. We can figure out what 105th term is. But this is a classic example where you're not going to sit down and actually solve to figure out what 105th term is. Nobody cares. They're not asking us what the 105th term is. So of course, even though it says, even though it says what is 105th term, we must always understand that we are not being asked what 105th term is. What we are being asked is, do we have enough data? Do we have sufficient data to be able to figure out if we wanted to? And the answer is, of course, we have sufficient data. The answer is C. Nobody in the right mind is going to waste the time. Either you use the formula or you do it manually. Manually will take even longer, but it's not necessary, so I'm not going to do it. 286. 286 says that we have a concrete block. Concrete block. We are told that each face, each face is a rectangle. In other words, it's a rectangular block. It is a very fancy, very annoying way of saying it is a re rectangular uh, box, if you like. It's a rectangular box. And the question simply is, what's its volume? What's its volume? And volume, we know, we require length times width times height. That's what we have to figure out in order, in order, in order for us to ascertain what its volume is. Let's see what we're given to us. The first statement tells us that four lateral faces have area of 200 square inches each. 200 square inches each. Again, they use this term just to annoy us. The fact that you're talking about lateral faces. If you don't know what lateral faces are, don't worry about it. It makes absolutely no difference at all. Just understand that four of his faces, we are told, have surface area of 200 square inches. So let's draw our, let's draw our uh, box here. I left no room for myself. I'm going to raise this part here. Let's draw a little box here and see what we can do. I'm going 
going to just draw a small one. So here's our length, here's our width, and here's our height. So far so good. And what the first statement tells us is that, so what does lateral face mean? I never told you this. Lateral face simply means faces, uh, all the four faces except the top and the bottom. So we're not interested in top and the bottom, but like I said, it doesn't matter. If you end up, if you end up using top and the bottom, it doesn't matter. Just four faces, opposite faces you, that, you, that you understand. A top and the bottom you leave out or you leave out two sides, that's what it is. So lateral faces simply means that we're not looking at top, we're not looking at this guy, and we're not looking at the bottom. So what we're told here is that length times height, length times height, which is same as, because they're equal, length times height, which is this guy right here, is same, has the same area as width times height. This is also height, as you can see there, this is height also, width times height, and they're equal to 200. They have the area of 200. Now, before we do any work, let's first understand that because they are both equal, the, don't worry about the fact that they are equal to 200, because they are equal, that tells us, the height drops out, that tells us length is equal to width. Length, length will have to be equal to width. So let's begin then. So length times width, we are told, is equal to height times width. So just plug in some numbers. Let's just plug in some numbers and see what happens here. For example, we can do 20 times 10, which equals 20 times 10. Make sure I write exactly. Make sure I want to make sure that W appears in the same spot because obviously W is 10 and and the length and the length and the height as you can see they are equal. So let's see what the volume is here. Volume we know is equal to length times width times height. I'm probably taking too long. It shouldn't have to take this long. The length here is 20. I hope you are able to see that we will not be able to figure out the exact value of the volume. It depends on what we put down. We know these two are these two are equal to each other. We know these two are equal to each other. But uh, we'll see. That doesn't tell us what they are. They just they're just equal. The length is equal to height, but it doesn't tell us what they are. So here, length is 20, width is 10. Width is 10 and height is also 20 and it will give us some volume but for all we know it could also be it could be anything it could be 200 times 1 it could be 200 times 1 which is the height 200 times 1 in which case it will be different the length now is 200 the width is the width is 1 and this is 200 as you can see it's different or it could be 50 times 4 if you like. And now of course we are being silly, which is why it's not something you will do in the exam. Just understand that the first statement by itself is not enough. We cannot figure out the volume. A, D, B, C, E. Answer, first statement by itself is not enough, which means the answer cannot be A or D. That's all you have to understand. This part, I'm doing it just so you can see it. But I hope in the real exam you are able to see yourself immediately, within seconds, within 3 seconds, 5 seconds, 10 seconds at the most, that we cannot figure out the volume just by knowing that these two sides are equal to each other. It depends on what they are. And again, it will be different here. The length now is 50. The height is 50. And the width is 4. The volume keeps changing. First statement by itself is not enough. Let's see what the second statement tells us. Second statement tells us. Second statement tells us that the that the top is a square. The top is a square. Voila. Which is why they make a fuss about the lateral faces because the top and the bottom they are squares. Even though they say each face is rectangle, they are not lying to us because square is a rectangle. Is a special kind of rectangle. So, and we are told the top and bottom top is a square and has area has area of 400 square inches. This is where it comes in handy. So where is our square, right? Where is our top? Top is right here, which is this side right here, which is the W, and the length. There you go, W times length, we are told, is a square and it has an area of 400. If it has the area of 400, which means W must be 20 and length must be 20 because it's a square. 
there we go again by itself by itself we cannot figure out the volume we need a third side third side is not here so second statement by itself is not enough but when we put the two statements together then we put the two statements together oh I erased it I just erased it now we know the length is 20 uh, uh, length times length times width times height width is 20 length is 20 and we know that uh, it is 200 on the top which means the height must be 10 which means height must be 10 because this is 20 times 10 20 times 10 is going to give us the area lateral area lateral area of 200 square inches and now we can figure out the volume the answer is C this is an excellent example of why you shouldn't do it out because data sufficiency problems if you do them out sometimes they take forever and ever because you're not expected to do them out you're not required to do them out you simply have to be able to tell that we have enough data which is precisely why I did it which is precisely why I just did it out to show it to you how long it can take what a waste of time what an utter waste of time sheer waste of time number 287 We just did 286, 287. Let's hope I didn't miss anything. Let me just check. Yes, we are on 287. Again, 287 is another classic example. You will see here that if you sit there and do out the number 287 that we are about to do, which we are going to do it out just for learning purposes, but we simply answer the question based on the fact whether or not we have sufficient data, and that's all it is. But we do not do it out in the real exam, as I repeat in every single video. It's not, it's not something, you, something you should do. We are told that machine R, machine R and S work at their respective constant rate. Obviously, whenever we have work time problem, obviously we always assume that they are working at a constant rate and uh, that they work at their respective constant rate. The question is, how long, how long will R take, how long will R take by itself, this is important, by itself, by, how long will R take by itself to do the job. If machine R, if you turn off machine, if you turn off machine S and let machine R do the whole job, whatever the job is, maybe you maybe you're assembling some widgets, whatever it is, if you let uh, machine S, uh, if you let the machine R do the job by itself, how long will it take to do the job? Let's see what we're told. The first statement tells us that S takes three quarter of the time, three quarter of the time that R takes, that R takes. By itself we cannot figure out, just now we know that a, a machine S is faster because it finishes the job in, in three quarter of the time, but it's not enough information. It's not enough information to figure out what the other guy is going to take. We have to know, we have to know how long are they going to take working together. If we can figure out how long they are taking working together, okay, here, listen carefully. If we know how long they take working together, both of them together, if we know how long they take, and we also know how fast one of them is going, of course we can figure out the other one. We want to figure out how long does R take, we want to figure out how long the R takes, we know how fast S is compared to R. If we can figure out how long they take together, that's all we need. So first statement by itself is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. Since first statement by itself is not enough, answer cannot be A or D. Second statement hopefully will tell us how long they take together. And second statement tells us that R and S together, R and S together, take 12 minutes 
12 minutes. Again, by itself, it's not enough. Answer cannot be B. But if you put them together, that's it. That's all we need. We know how long they take together. We know the speed of one guy compared to the other one. We can figure out the other one. The answer is C. And that's all it is. That's the end of the story as far as the real exam is concerned. What we're going to, what we're going to do in the next few minutes is actually solve the problem, but not in the real exam. I need the room, so I'm going to erase all of this thing. We're going to erase all of this thing. You already know what it is. We're going to solve it. Just to get some practice in the work time problem. So here we go. So let's begin then. Let's suppose. Let's suppose. R takes M minutes. M for the minutes, R takes M minutes. That, tell, that implies that S must take S must take 3 quarter of M minutes. I should have put M in the parentheses. R must take 3 quarter of M minutes. Because that's what the problem told us, that S does the job in 3 quarter of our time. So here's what's going on. So if they work for M minutes, if R works for M minutes, what happens? In M minutes, in M minutes, in M minutes, R does one job. Are you with me so far? Similarly, in in three, three quarter of the minutes, three quarter of the minutes, S does one job. Are you with me? Watch what happens now. Whenever you have the fraction, whenever you have the fraction, it's always a good idea to get rid of the fraction. This is an equation, you understand? This is an equation. Even though it's written in the form of a sentence, a sentence is an equation. A sentence written in the mathematical language is an equation. So let's multiply both sides of the equation by 4 to, because I want to get rid of this 4 from the bottom. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by 4 and what we find is that in 3m minutes, S does 4 jobs. In 3m minutes, S does 4 jobs. There we go. Now we have 3m here because we are trying to find the same, we are trying to find the same amount of time for both of them. So now this guy does, we know he does 4 jobs in 3m minutes and this guy in 3m minutes, in 3m minutes will do 3 jobs. R will do 3 jobs in 3m minutes because it takes m minutes for us to do job. We are almost done. So what do we find out? What we find out is that together, together, they do, this guy does 3M job, this guy, uh, th this guy does 3 jobs, this guy does 4 jobs, together they do 7 jobs in 3M minutes. Together they do 3M minutes, which implies, which implies that they should be able to do 1 job. They should be able to do one job in 3m over 7. 3m over 7. And we know how long they take to do one job together. This is together part. This is a together part. Problem told us together they can do it in 12 minutes. There we go. Now we can figure out the m part. And m should equal 12 times 7 over 3. As I'm doing it, I'm feeling quite silly. We shouldn't do this. Divide top and bottom by 3, we get 4, which means together they take 28 minutes. Together they take 28 Or rather, not together, sorry. M, M was, the question was, how long will R take? Together, of course, they take 12 minutes. It says in the problem. I got lost for a second. That's it. Answer is, 20, answer is 28. The question was, how long does, uh, how long does, uh, R take to do the job and we assume that R takes M minutes, we just found out M is 28. R, R, if it were to do the job by itself, would have taken him 28 minutes. But if they work together, they can do it in 12 minutes. As, I'm, as, I, as I was erasing this thing, I was debating whether or not to continue with this thing to make you understand the logical explanation behind it. I don't know if I actually want to do it, but uh,
Let's not go there, shall we? Let's not go there. Let's just leave it there. The last problem on, on number on, on, on the in the first column on page 207, which is number 288. 288. If you're not very good at work time problem. As I've told you many times before in the past, if you're looking for any concepts in math uh, dealing with the exam, you will always find some more problem to practice on if you if you want to get better at it. Just type in my name first, because otherwise, of course, without my name, you're going to get a thousand hits. Just type in Keshwani and just type in the name of the, con con name of the concept. Just type in Keshwani, work time problems, and you will find a whole bunch of them that are problems that I have done in the past. 288. We are told that you and we are both positive. The question simply is, which is greater? Which is greater? U raised to V or V raised to U? That's the question. Let's see what the first problem tells us. First statement tells us. First statement tells us that U is equal to 1. Well, if U is equal to 1, is there going to be enough to figure for us to figure out U, which one is bigger, U raised to V or V raised to U? I hope you're able to tell right away that that's not enough. That is not going to be enough. A, D. BCE. The first term by itself is not enough. You should be able to see immediately without doing any work at all. But since we are practicing right now for learning purposes, I'll give you a couple of examples just to be able to see how to tackle this thing. Because there's, there's, there's something weird I'm about to do. Okay, listen. So U raised to V versus V raised to U. U we are told is 1. So that's not a matter of choice. U is 1. Let's make U, let's, I, was, I was about to say let's make U equal to 1, but that would not be a correct statement. That's not, that's not what we're doing. That's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a matter of choice. So to say that let's make u equal to 1 would be silly. u is 1. We are told that. Let's make v equal to 1. Can we do that? Why not? There is nowhere in the problem it says that u and v have to be different numbers. There is nowhere in the problem it tells us that u and v cannot be equal. Since the problem does not tell us that they cannot be equal, why can't they be equal? Of course they can be equal. In which case, 1 raised to 1, 1 raised to 1 is equal to each other. You see that? Now next time, u, v, u will always remain 1 because it's told, we are told that it is 1. Let's make v equal to 2. If v is equal to 2 and v is, u is 1, of course now this guy is bigger. Let's do something else. How about if v happens to be half? I want you to be able to see, I want you to be able to open your mind and see all the possibilities. Nowhere in the problem says that they have to be integers. Nowhere it says that. So if that happens, if v happens to be half, it does just have to be positive. All we are told is that they are positive. It doesn't say positive integers. It just says, if you read the problem carefully, it just says u is greater than 0 and v is greater than 0. Well, half should do it. What happens now? Half raised to 1 is just half. 1 raised to half is 1. This guy is bigger. There we go. I didn't have to show three different scenarios, we just have to show two scenarios. As long as we get conflicting answer, obviously it's not enough. But I'm trying to point out to you here that this is what it is. That we, can, we can very easily show three different scenarios, equal to, greater than, or less than. First statement by itself is not enough. We established, we established that long time ago. Let's look at second statement. Second statement says, Second statement says that v is greater than 2. v is greater than 2. Again, same thing. u raised to v and v raised to u. And this time, we have to make v greater than 2. Let's make v equal to 3. And that's going to be our constant. We're not going to change it. Let's make v equal to 3. What happens? 1 raised to 3 versus 3 raised to 1. Obviously, this guy is greater. What, what are you supposed to be going to do next? Can you figure it out? No, same thing what we did before. 3 raised to 3 versus 3 raised to 3. It doesn't say anywhere in the problem that they cannot be equal. Now they're equal. We're getting conflicting answers. We don't have to do one more scenario. I'm just going to do it just to, uh, just to, just to please you. Actually, let's not do one more. Because to do one more, to figure out the next scenario, we'll have to require some work. 
will have to do some thinking. Do it yourself. Do it yourself. But if you look at the book, in the book they actually do actually do, do one the scenario where it is greater, where they make a 3 raised to 4, they make v equal to 4. In this case, v is equal to 4 here. And then we have 4 raised to 3. In this, in this case, 4 raised to 3 is 64, this is 81, this is greater. The point here is, second statement by itself is also not enough. Answer is not b. Answer is not b. But, if you put them together, what happens? Let's put them together. Let's put them together now. Let's put them together. Now we know that u has to be 1. And v has to be more than more than 2. So we're going to make v equal to 3. And we're going to keep it constant. If v is 3, if v is 3 and u is 1, it is less. What happens? Let's make let's make a all we know is that v has to be v has to be more than two. V has to be more than two. Let's make let's make v two and a half. Why not? There's no reason why v cannot be two and a half. So two and a half raised to one, two and a half raised to one, of course it's gonna be it's always this guy is always gonna be less than this guy because u is one. One 1 raised to any power, 1 raised to any power is always be 1. This guy is always going to be 1, and this guy is always going to be more than 1, because you are raising something more than 2, 3 raised to 1, 4 raised to 1, 2 and a half raised to 1, it's always going to be more than 1, and this is always 1. Together we can figure out which statement is greater. The answer is C. The answer is C. Which statement is greater? The answer is this, this statement is greater, given the fact that u is equal to, if u is equal to 1, and v is more than 2. If we have those two conditions, then v raised to u will always be greater. That's the end of the column. I'm going to stop right here. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow in the next, uh, to, tomorrow in the next video, we'll do the multiple choice problem. As you know now, as you know by now, we alternate. Do you understand? After having watched this video, if you found it helpful and if you like to work with me, as I told you in the beginning of the video, if you want to get hold of me, please send me an email at kashwaniprep at icloud.com and we'll work together. All right. I know.